want to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules today to, to lend your expertise to our panel. And I'll start out with an easy question. Um, if, if you would, just talk a little bit about your company and its impact and relevance to Wisconsin's agricultural economy. Sure. Um, thank you. Good morning, uh, Dr. Bertram. You forgot one thing. Both those teams that played Saturday night beat Michigan this year. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, Lakeside Foods, I'm Glenn Tellock, uh, President and CEO of Lakeside Foods, and we, we are a 132-year-old uh, family-owned company based in uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, with um, 12 either processing or distribution facilities located throughout Wisconsin or southeastern Minnesota, uh, one in, in, um, in Ohio. And our primary uh, core business is uh, canned and frozen vegetables. Uh, we also have a frozen appetizer business, and then two joint ventures, one in whipped topping and one in canned pet food. Um, and so obviously, you know, the egg side of the business is very important to us. We contract, uh, I would say, nearly 90,000 acres of, of land, either in Minnesota, some in Iowa, some in Illinois, but mostly in Wisconsin, on an annual basis. Cindy? I'm Cindy Leitner. Uh, we are not that old. We are about a year old. The Wisconsin Dairy Alliance was formed a year ago. We decided that we needed to have an organization in Wisconsin that represented the regulated farms. Now, what does that mean to you? You've all heard about CAFOs. A CAFO is anyone who has 700 cows or more. So these are the farms in Wisconsin that have more than 700 cows. We have 7,500 uh, 7, farms in Wisconsin and about 1.3 million cows. The CAFOs represent 280 of those 7,500 farms. They represent about a quarter of the number of cows, about 330,000, but we produce 40% of the milk in the state. So we were organized to watch regulations, which are absolutely critical for us to grow and to look forward to the future of dairying in Wisconsin. Steve? Good, good morning, Steve Johnson, uh, factory manager, John Deere Horkin Works, and, and I've been uh, very fortunate to work with a company that's committed to, be, to those that are linked to the land. And so our company started in 1837 with the uh, uh, invention of the self-scouring plow, and we've been uh, a part of agricultural uh, industry ever since. Uh, we are a global company with over 70 factories uh, in, in multiple different countries around the world, uh, helping farmers uh, uh, produce the crops that they need to produce. Uh, our specific facility in Hork in Wisconsin uh, started as a, as a grain drill manufacturing company in 1861. Uh, John Deere bought the facility in 1911, and, and John Deere has operated the facility since then. Uh, we currently build riding lawn tractors and our gator utility vehicles. And our gator utility vehicles that, that come out of the factory are, again, very heavily linked to our agriculture and agriculture producers, uh, providing the vehicles that help them take care of their cows, uh, mend their farms, tend their fences, uh, produce or, or move uh, material around their, their farms. So, again, a long history with our company and being tied to the agricultural industry. Thank you. Now, th thinking about um, each of your um, uh, sectors of the agricultural economy, and Glenn, obviously a lot of growing um, associated with, with your business, um, how would you assess the state of Wisconsin's agricultural economy from a grower's perspective? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I, the, you know, the business side of, of what we do is actually pretty good. You're exactly right. It's the growing side that's been a little bit of a challenge, especially the last two years when you look at the amount of, of rain that we've had um, and, and then the, the early fall and the early uh, freezing. Uh, and the challenge for us is we get to turn our inventory once. You know, we grow it and then we're going to sell it 12, you know, the next 12 months. So. Um, the, the challenge is, is, is having the right amount of, of acres, uh, having the right, the, the right farmers that want to do that business because they have alternatives. They, they can provide to the dairy side of the business too as feed to the dairy side. And, and so the, um, um, it, you know, we have you know, three and four generation farmers that have, have contracted with Lakeside. Um, but I can assure you that's not getting easier. It's getting harder and harder as the, as the amount of land continues to shrink. 
Um, so the challenge is, uh, you know, our, our VP of uh, operations is here today, and his, his biggest challenge is to secure what we need for our sales. And uh, he may have one of the toughest jobs in the organization. Another big aspect of Wisconsin's farm economy is ethanol production. Do you end up with, uh, in competition for acreage, for grain, for food versus uh, ethanol? Yeah, d definitely. Um, th that, uh, now, I would say um, the, big, the big spike in ethanol um, several, several years ago uh, was, was a hit to the, to the growing uh, area. But I think when you look at um, what the farmers, are, whether it's the central states here in, in Wisconsin or southeast Minnesota, um, it's, still a, it's still a relatively um, good, uh, good alternative uh, to be growing the vegetables versus the uh, corn for the ethanol. So it's a, it's a challenge to us, but it's no different than, than any other alternative, as I said, for the dairy side. Cindy, can you talk about the dairy industry? Wow, um, that's a lead-in. You've all read a lot about the dairy industry, particularly in the last year, in the last couple of years, and the struggles the dairy industry has had. We've had low prices for milk for five years now. How many of you know how we get paid? Anybody in this room know how farmers get paid for their milk? You know, you all get to set your prices, correct? So if your inputs go up, you can raise your price and you know what your price is going to be because you're the one setting it, most people don't understand that far, excuse me, farmers don't set their price. They don't get to change the price. They don't get to change it when their inputs go up. They have to accept the price that's given to them. And this is done in the federal order. It's been around since, I don't know, the 30s. So we've dealt with this for many, many years. And we understand how to do it. But unlike you, when there's competition or when there are other things, we can't adjust as readily as people think. So when water costs more than a gallon of milk, we can't go out and raise the price of milk. So that's a big issue for us. Now, do we want pricing? No, we understand that, but it's been low. So we've had to deal with that. The other issue that we've had to deal with is weather. And this year in particular, it's been a little bit rainy and not much sunshine, and not great for growing. No. So imagine what happens to a farm then. They have the ability to put manure, I'll use the word instead of nutrient management, mm -hmm. onto their land when it's not raining and when the crops aren't growing. So a little bit in spring and a little bit in fall. And they've got to get that all out and get that all taken care of. So weather's been a big problem. It's also been a problem with the quality of the crops, and you know this readily. So the, the quality of the crops that we're getting off, if we're even getting them off, and you've seen cornfields that are still standing, some will stand till next summer, we just can't get good quality crops. So that will in turn create a problem with our feed. So this spring, we are looking at having problems with our animals, we're looking at problems with our nutrition, we're looking at problems with being able to obtain feed, to feed our cows. So we've got some problems coming. And beyond that, the biggest thing what we have an issue with in Wisconsin is regulations. And you probably all saw in the paper all the stuff about ATCP 51, which is a livestock siting. That went through its course of action in time. We now are opening up NR 151, which is the manure management program. That's being opened as a rule. So they're going to readjust that. We're anticipating that there's going to be quite a bit more coming down the road in the next couple of years. So besides the pricing and the weather, we now have regulations that we're having to deal with in an economy that we're struggling through. The good news, milk is at $20. It's the highest it's been in a really long time. We're making money. If this continues, we will get better. Farmers have lived with bad crops and the price of milk fluctuating for a long, long time. We understand it. We understand how to work with it. The regulations are the things that are killing us. Steve, how does your company see the state of agriculture in Wisconsin from the perspective of your customers? So our customers are actually, you know, Glenn and, and the dairy industry, and so the challenges they face turn into the challenges that we face from an equipment manufacturing standpoint. So um, certainly the weather conditions that this year, uh, a, a very cold, wet spring, 
uh, farmers needed, had a very, very short window to be able to get their, their crops in the ground. Um, and, and so that, that put a lot of challenges on equipment. Our equipment going out and working in muddy fields and those types of things uh, caused a lot of reliability issues or durability issues. And so that, that provides challenges to our customers and, and to us as a company. Um, and then, as Glenn talked about, the, in the, the wet fall and the cold fall, and, and a lot of the crops are still standing. Um, and, and so, you know, those, when, when, the, when the crops are still in the field, the farmer's not getting paid for it. When the farmer doesn't have any income from his crops, then it's hard to say, gee, I want to buy a new tractor, I want to buy a new combine. Uh, so it, it creates challenges for us as a company. Uh, we continue to see a diversity of, of customers. So you still got the small and medium-sized customers, but we're seeing consolidation in farms, getting to, to bigger and bigger uh, customers. Those bigger customers are covering more acreages, uh, so that is, re is requiring a change in, in equipment, uh, bigger equipment, faster equipment to be able to, to cover the acreage quicker. And so all that creates a lot of challenges for us. So as the, as the, farther, as the farmers chase, uh, face challenges, those challenges come directly into the uh, equipment that we're trying to provide them and the business conditions that we have as a, as a company. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, and I'm not going to ask you to predict the weather next year. No. Uh, I won't ask any of you to do that, but do you see uh, any opportunities for Wisconsin's agricultural economy to improve next year and, and, the, and the subsequent years? And if so, what would, what would you, where do you see the opportunity for improvement? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I would answer the, the weather would help tremendously. <laughs> um, you know, quite frankly, if you, if you, but I think what, what people are starting to do are, are, are saying, okay, if this is what I'm dealt with, and this is the great thing about agriculture, you know, that farmer's mentality, that, you know, they've dealt with it since, you know, forever, you know, they just get things done. And so it's really, how do you, how, how, how what are we doing in our business to minimize the impacts of the weather? The question could be, maybe we shouldn't sell so much. Maybe there's some customers you're not going to take. Maybe you are going to have fewer, fewer acres that you're going to contract. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really a combination of all those things. That, but, but you have the customer that, um, and, and it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting dynamic because you're, you're selling to the retail side or the food service side or the industrial side, not knowing, having any idea what you're going to produce. Um, and and that's, that becomes a challenge. And, and so obviously, if, if it's an entire industry, if it's you know, bad in the Northwest or bad in the Midwest at the same time, the product's just not there. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm a, you know, one year is not a trend, but, but the weather of the last two years has been a real challenge. You start asking yourself, um, uh, are the weather patterns changing? And, I, and, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. But I, I would just say, I'm, I'm not sure, um, let, let's take uh, Minnesota this year, the sugar beet crop. There was an article in the uh, Star Tribune, worst crop in 48 years. How do you predict something like that? So I think the, ma the fact of the matter is we can't change, to your point, the prices can't change as fast as, as the conditions do. But I think there's got to be some dynamics between us, the retailers, uh, looking at what we do to diversify our business. But I, I mean, just being, just playing the odds, I, I would say business would improve next year um, just under some normal conditions. Cindy, you already alluded to the fact that, that milk prices are on the uptick. Mm -hmm. Do you see that trend continuing next year? And what do you think the outlook is for the dairy industry? Well, I'm going to surprise you. I think it's pretty good. And the reason I think it's good is not necessarily because the milk prices are going up, which they are and they're predicted to hold at the $20 at the door um, for the next foreseeable future at least. Nobody likes to predict too far in the future with milk. But we have a different trend that's going on. So you have to look at what's going on in the nation. For many, many years, we had fluid milk coming to Wisconsin from the Northeast. When the fluids went down, the milk started coming to the, it went from New York to Pennsylvania to Ohio to Michigan and into Wisconsin. So if you sit outside of um, some of the milk plants, some of the cheese plants, you'll see the Michigan trucks coming in on a regular basis, and they're able to bring it in cheaper than we can produce it in Wisconsin. Well, next year, about 18 months, I believe, there's going to be a huge plant for processing opening up in Michigan. 
and they're going to take in 8 million gallons of milk a day. And all that milk coming from the east is going to stop. On the west side, South Dakota, and if there are any cheesemakers in here, which I hope there are, at your last meeting, you talked about South Dakota. And why did you talk about South Dakota? Because it's growing like crazy. They're putting up large farms like crazy. They're adding production like crazy. The baby bell producers in Little Shoot in Wisconsin moved there. Why? Milk supply. They were able to get more milk. They didn't grow here. They went to South Dakota. So what's going to happen when all this occurs? We're not going to be able to produce the milk. We're going to have to grow. Our dairies are going to have to get bigger. We're going to have to add more cows. We're going to have to produce better. So we keep our supply to our cheese factories. Do you know that we are the largest producer of butter in the United States and the largest producer of cream cheese in the United States? We are one of the top cheese producers. I will say second to California, very reluctantly. We'll change that. Um, but we do a lot of good things. And I think there's a good future for the dairy industry in Wisconsin with the advent of what's going on in the economy across the United States. Steve? So I think I'll start with the broader perspective. So, you know, Wade talked about uh, some, some future-looking numbers. By, by 2050, the world population is going to be uh, 9 billion to 9.5 billion people. We have to feed all, all of those people. And, and as, as, as the world economy grows, uh, uh, people are they're becoming a, a bigger middle class. And, and as, as people become more affluent and move into a middle class, their diet changes from grains to higher protein uh, meals. And, and that requires, puts more of a burden on, on agriculture. Uh, there's only so much land in, in the world that can be farmed. So we have to, uh, I, the, the fundamentals long term for agriculture really look good uh, because our farms are, need to be able to feed the world. They, we need to be able to improve our, our efficiency and our effectiveness of growing crops and, and, and also getting those crops to the markets where, uh, where people need to con consume those, uh, those goods. So the long-term fundamentals for, agricultural, for agriculture for our company uh, look very, very strong be because of the world's population and the changing uh, dietary habits. If I take a look at short-term in our company, the, the, the kind of the word that, that we are talking about all the time is uncertainty. There is so much uncertainty in the agriculture market. Uh, our farmers have to have access to the markets, and our Wisconsin farmers have to have access to markets. So with trade deals that aren't uh, finalized, with, uh, with tariffs that are in place, our farmers are, don't have the access to the free trade uh, markets that they need to have, so that's creating uncertainty for them. The weather uh, patterns and, and the weather we've had the last couple of years, as Glenn said, has created uncertainty uh, for them. and, and um, has, has impacted their, their finances, so the ability to buy new equipment. Uh, we have an election year uh, taking place in 2020, so that's going to uh, add a certain amount of uncertainty. So, you know, it, it could be a great year if, if, uh, if trade deals get, get signed and those types of things. It could have a whole bunch of upward potential. Uh, if, it, if it continues in today's, it, it's going to be more of a, a flat economy or a flat marketplace for us. So again, long-term uh, outlook looks really favorable, uh, but short-term there is just a tremendous amount of uncertainty of what the, what the business is going to look like, what our customers are going to do, and, and, uh, and what type of year it's going to be for us. Well, that, that answer is a great segue into my next question, uh, because it, it looks like the U.S. House of Representatives uh, may finally have gotten their act together and uh, may actually uh, you know, approve the U.S.-Mexico, uh, Canada-Mexico agreement. Uh, Glenn, what would uh, uh, ratification of that agreement mean uh, to Wisconsin's growers and Wisconsin's agricultural economy, given that Mexico and, and Canada are two, our two largest trading partners? Mm -hmm. It's a positive um, for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, one, uh, just the, the, you know, a lot of what's not produced here can be procured from the different areas. Um, there are other uh, grains, commodities, and things like that that just uh, simplify the entire, the entire process. But I think it's, um, you know, for us, and we're primarily a domestic-based uh, company, but our, our largest export markets um, are either Canada and, and, uh, and Mexico and Latin America. So I, 
for, for us, you know, it's a positive, but I think um, to, to Steve's point, you know, uh, it's that confidence where people will spend money in the capital side of their businesses, uh, us included, when, when there's some, some certainty and, and there's confidence in what's going on. And it gives you that ability to, to put money back into your business to improve it, to grow it, and, and make it more efficient. So some of the things that are our challenges, you know, can be taken on with certain capital improvements. But if there's not a better economy to look forward, I mean, everybody wants an ROI on what they're spending. I think it just gives a greater confidence that we as a larger trading partner can then take on some of the other trade, trade um, deals that, that we can look to that one to say, hey, we can get it done. And, and I applaud, you know, it's taken two years, but I do applaud at least the fact that it is getting done. Cindy, very early on in uh, President Trump's presidency, there was a, a lot of news made about um, uh, filtered milk in Canada. Um, w w from a dairy perspective, what would the USMCA ratification mean for Wisconsin dairy farmers? Well, it's good. I mean, we want it. We need it. We need it for our future. And again, for the certainty that we're talking about, if you're talking about an immediate impact, there won't be an immediate impact. Those markets, the markets that we had with, um, with Mexico and Canada and all of the business back and forth, it's going to take time. It's going to take time to build that back up to create those sales again. And if somebody believes that we're going to turn a switch once this is ratified and all of a sudden there's going to be all kinds of trade, um, they're, they're being misled. It'll take time to rebuild that. What happened when that occurred is that there was harm to the process of the people that were buying from us. They had to find other, they had to find other people. It's food. You know, it's very simple. So um, it is a good thing and I'm glad that they're finally getting to it as they're getting to a lot of things, hopefully, besides what they're talking about today. <laughs> which is worthless, <laughs> but it is, it is a good thing and it's very, very necessary. It's very necessary for our economy in Wisconsin because trade is a big focus for the cheese industry. And it's also, which most of you again don't know about how we price our milk and how we get paid, exports are part of how we get paid. So if the export percentage goes up, we get paid more. So we really like exports. We'd like that to happen. Thank you, Steve. So yeah, I, I think as I said before, getting the uh, USMCA ratified um, will bring some certainty to the marketplace. I agree that it's, the markets aren't going to come back as quickly, and, and our farmers need to access to these to these markets. Um, as, as companies, we could we can go to Mexico or we can go to Canada and we can build factories. You cannot take the land that's here in Wisconsin that's great farmland that has the ability to, to grow crops, um, and you can't transport that anyplace else. It is, it is here, so we have to be able to make the maximum use of that land and, and the crops that it produced, and we have to be able to get that produce uh, to other companies or countries. So we, we need free trade, we need free trade around the world, and so you know, I'm glad the administration has taken on the, the, the challenge of trying to open up markets, and I think the USMCA is, is a great first step to being able to, to have more, more free, more balanced trade, which again opens up the markets for our, for our agricultural products to be able to, uh, to, to go to other countries where they need the, the food and the nutrients for their population. And then for our company, that provides then the ability as our farmers have, uh, have uh, better access and, and better markets and, and better profitability then to invest in equipment uh, to continue the cycle of, of then improving their yields and their outputs of their farms. Very good, thank you. Um, thinking about the, uh, the agricultural economy and um, you know, as a whole, or, or the dairy aspect of it, or, or the, you know, the, the equipment manufacturing uh, aspect of it, what would each of you view as, as the biggest challenge facing the industry? And that's not the weather. No, no, no. <laughs> we can't control that, so. I really believe f from our perspective, I think it's the consumer pace of change. I think when you look at, uh, I, I was reading something the other day and it talked about the amount, just a quantity of data that was available in, in 1900, you know, it doubled like every 500 years. 
In 2000, that same statistic was two years, and they're saying it could be under that same statistic uh, 30 days. Wow. And that's just a quantity of data. So what's happening is you had the baby boomers, then you, somebody mentioned earlier, then you had Gen X, and then you had, and that was the baby boomers was a long period. Then you had Gen X, then there's the millennials, now Gen Y, Gen Z. These are all different, different ways that they're going to market. You know, the consumer is looking at us. And so when you take the, a look at our business and the challenge, you know, the way you make you know, money, it's, it's certainly not going to be at the retail price side. It's how efficient are you in the operational side. So most of the people have large manufacturing facilities. It's not set up for these, um, you know, the, the pace of innovation you're seeing in the food side of the business. And that's why people have great ideas, and, and that's how we find a lot of different ideas, is people have them, and then they need to scale it with the distribution. We have all that, um, but it's just a matter of, of how you pay for some of that uh, pace of change in, in the retail or food service side of the business. And, and so while consumers' needs are changing, they're still the core business that we have in the primary vegetables, but it's taking now and adding grains to it, adding sauces to it, and these other things that are changing the dynamics of what the consumer wants and how they're, how they're you know, the, the beauty is people have to eat. You, you mentioned it, people are gonna drink milk, they're gonna, they have to, they have to consume things. We just have to find the right things that they want and try to project what that is, which is very difficult. So for us, I mean, just being an old, you know, 132 years old, um, you know, the pace of change in our business is, is very difficult to keep up with the consumer pace of change. And how does the, the availability of workers um, I impact that pace of change? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, I mean, you had a whole panel on it. I mean, everything they, they said is, is, is the same with us. And, you know, but it, I, I think that's one of the things that, that can be attractive for our industry. You know, you can, you, we, can, we can attract people to our business to say, here's, here's what we do, here's where we're trying to get to, we need you to be part of our business to help us get there. I mean, we have, let's be honest, we had a lady that just retired with 66 years of service. What do you think her pace of change was? Um, and, and so we, we, we are trying to find those people that have, you know, you talked about the marketing skills, the, um, a lot of the different ideas that they can bring to, to our, I'll call it an old line business, legacy business. Um, but a lot of things that we're doing right now, some of the acquisitions we did, we bring some talent with it as we acquire these companies that only have sales of a million, two million dollars, but they got great ideas and they need to scale in the distribution. Cindy, the biggest challenge? There's three. Regulations, which I'm going to talk about all the time because that's really at the forefront for what we need to do. There's perception. People perceive large farms to be bad. And then there's the labor. So we really have three areas that are, are struggling. Um, a quick on the regulatory side. We had a farmer that cited a farm. It took him six years and six million dollars to cite his farm. He's now moved all his heifers out of state. It took him one day and a thousand dollars to cite that location for his heifers. Most of our farms don't have their young stock in the state anymore. They've moved it out. We haven't had a greenfield large farm built in Wisconsin for several years, and right now I don't know of any that are being cited. So we essentially have stopped the growth of large farms in the state due to regulations. That guy who did six years and six million dollars is a generational farm, and he's told his family they will not build in Wisconsin again. That's not good for us. We need those families to stay because 99% of our farms and even our large CAFOs that you hear about that are so horrible in the news, those are large generational farms. They're owned by families, cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters. They grew because they wanted the family to stay on the farm. They're not bad people. That's my regulation story. <laughs> labor. You all know about the labor problem. The biggest thing that we've been trying to do, because we can't use the H-2A visa, it's a seasonal visa, Six months, dairying is year-round, multi-year. We got workers that don't want citizenship, but they want to work here and they want to go home someday. They want to work here for 10 years and go home. They don't want citizenship. We need a long-term worker visa. Many countries have them. The United States does not have that for egg. 
So we've been working at the federal level to try to get that accomplished. So we've had that issue also. We have members all over the state, of course, but even in areas that are you know, very densely populated in, in, you know, here in Dane County, in Milwaukee County, in Brown County, struggling to find workers, how much more difficult is it when you're talking about trying to hire people to work on a farm in you know, Lafayette County or you know, somewhere else in, the, in, in rural Wisconsin? Well, how hard is it to convince somebody to step in poop all day? It's pretty hard, but, um, and that's the struggle. I mean, we have a smaller pool of people to work with. We're doing more in automation. You hear about robotics, and those are going to increase. Um, the automation on farms has increased over the last 10 to 15 years, so that is also working for us. So we're doing a lot of different things along with that aspect of it. If you don't mind, just to touch on that, um, the, the, obviously the work conditions are, are one area, but for us, we almost double the size of our workforce in the summer for the seasonal help. Mm -hmm. And so we are recruiting from other parts of the country. We have the temporary labor, and, and again, we have people that have been coming back for three years. To your point, they don't, they don't want to harm anything. They don't want to do anything. What they want to do is they want to come to the Midwest in the summer where it's warm, because it's too, too hot where they are, mm -hmm. and the minute it gets cold, they want to go back home. And, and how, how we can't figure this out with government regulation or immigration reform, I don't understand, because demographically, if we want to you know, create all these jobs in the United States, the demographics won't support it in 15, 20 years. I mean, it, it, we, something has to be done. And so for us, I mean, again, we, we double the size of our workforce in the summer. Well, uh, this evening in Wausau, I'll be moderating a, a debate in the 7th Congressional District, and immigration reform will be one of the topics I ask about, because it's, yeah. it's clearly very important. Yeah. Um, Steve, what do you see as the, the biggest challenge facing agriculture in Wisconsin? So I think one of the biggest challenges um, for, for us as a company, and, and I think for agriculture, is, is technology. And, and, and really, as Cindy said, the, the, the face of agriculture, getting people attracted to agriculture and, and wanting to be in the industry. Um, you know, with, the, with STEM, we need, the, we need the brightest and the best coming into agriculture. Uh, we, again, we've only got so much land, and we've got to feed the world. So the, the land that we've got, we've got to figure out how to make it more productive. We've got to figure out how to make it more efficient. Uh, and, and our farmers are, are looking for, for that help. And, and so, uh, we've, we've got to do better with our, with our seeds and, and how do we um, make our, our, our seeds better to, to grow uh, crops uh, that, that have wider range of, of seasons, that, that they're more tolerant to, to weather changes, to, to provide more yields, and we have to have the technology uh, in, in our equipment. As we talked to farmers, 10 years ago the farmer told us, you need to bring my farm into my, or my office into my tractor cab or my combine cab. Now they're telling us, you need to bring my farm into my office. They want to know uh, what their equipment is doing every, every hour of the day. They want to know that their crops are being planted properly, that the nutrients are being applied properly, uh, that what their yield is so that they can plan, plan for the next year. When, when we take a look at, at what the farmers want to do, at, at 10 miles an hour, we need to make sure that we are accurately placing a seed of corn at the right depth, at the right spacing, as close as in the right proximity to the nutrients, so it can so it can get the nutrients to grow, um, and, and that that is all technology that that we need to develop and we need to have in our equipment. Uh, when you take a look at small grains, um, to have a good crop of small grains, uh, some of them you need a million seeds per acre, and you want to singulate those seeds. You want to be able to place every seed in the right spot. In a million seeds in that acre to make sure that you get the, the proper yield out of it. So I don't know that, that, uh, that the industry, whether it's academics or, or government or others, really understand that, that farming is a high-tech business nowadays. And, and again, we, we, our challenge is making sure that we're pulling in the brightest and the best to, to, to work on all aspects of it so that we can improve the efficiency, improve the yields, and be able to get what our farmers produce to, to the markets where, where people of the world need, uh, need the food. And that, that answers another 
great segue into what I think will have to be our final question uh, because of time. But we have a we have a room full of thought leaders, and we've got you know basically we've got high level business executives in this room. We have high level leadership from our academic institutions, and we have high level leaders from government. Um, if you were to give them advice on what we can do to position Wisconsin's agricultural economy to continue to be uh, a driver uh, you know, for, for development and, and job growth and production in our state, what, what would you tell these thought leaders? Glenn, we'll start with you. I was hoping to go last on that one. Um, <laughs> well, based on what's happening in government today, I'm not sure I should depend on that. Um, but, you know, certainly with the education side, I, Dr. Bertram said it all, I, I have nothing. But from a government standpoint, I, I'm going to go back to my comment on the, uh, the change. I, I think we're, you know, I don't, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, but so many of them are trying to solve real world, world problems with old thinking. And, and I, I struggle. I was in Washington last week as part of NAM, and, and you watched so, you know, some of these people, with the things they talk about and the things they're trying to do. Um, I just think we're, I just think our governments are just, you know, instead of worrying about us as, as you know, business is bad sometimes, and so it just divides that right there. I think they're, they're not worrying about the United States, they're worrying about individuals, and I, I struggle with that, and I think they're trying to solve today's problems with the things that aren't relevant anymore. Um, I would say, you know, statewide, um, you know, I think one of the things, and Chad touched on it a little bit when he was talking earlier, how do we market Wisconsin? And, and, and we've tried doing this in, in the Manitowoc area, and it just showed how difficult it is. Instead of trying to market Manitowoc or Two Rivers or Keel or Valders as individual, you know, cities, why don't we collaborate and say, let's go to, let's have a, a marketing pitch for all of Manitowoc County. And then if that works, like Sheboygan, Sheboygan does a great job, as Chad mentioned, why don't you throw in Calumet County, why don't you throw in you know, parts of Outagamie County and do it as a cluster? Because the new, the new kids want to go to these bigger clusters. They don't necessarily have to go to Milwaukee or Madison, but if they know there's a cluster of area that's an economic driver, you know, that's what's important to them. And I think we have to we have to market what we're trying to do differently, and that's what I would ask of the government. Um, is is to your point, I, I, I stay away from the regulatory side because that then it says Lakeside Foods on it, so I don't want I don't want to attract any attention to that. I'll let you do that. Um, <laughs> so f I'll let you do that for me. Um, okay. So Cindy and I will take care of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Scott and I've so, worked on a few things. Yeah, so I think I, I think that's really what I would ask is is listen, listen, and, and, and uh, um, uh, Wade said it also, use the data as, as opposed to emotion. And I get, I get if you don't believe the data, instead of, instead of spending all the time arguing the data that's given to you and saying why it's wrong, put the stake in the ground and say it's either, it's, it's, at least it's directional, and work off of that for the improvement. But we spend too much time debating and not enough time fixing. So that's what I would ask of the government and then the educators. I mean, they heard it already, so. Well said. Cindy? I'm on a little different bent again. Um, perception. That's another thing that our industry has. There's a perception out there that dairy farmers, well, even in this day and age, aren't very smart. You know, they're farmers. They can't hold a candle to anybody else. Well, I gotta tell you, they're incredibly smart and they handle a lot more things than we handle in a given day, all of them. We have a perception that our large farms are bad. It's the CAFO problems. Eggs polluted our water, egg is creating smells, egg is creating problems, there's antibiotics in our food, there's a whole realm of things that we get blamed for. Not necessarily valid or true. And I would encourage any of you that feel that way and I'm saying feel because you haven't been there, you haven't seen it, you haven't done it, you feel that way about a large farm or a CAFO, go visit one. There are plenty in Wisconsin that are willing to open their doors and walk you through their barns and walk you through their processes, what they're doing for the environment, how they're recycling because they live and die by recycling and being sustainable. 
with the land, with their water, with their animals, the care of their animals. This is their livelihood. So to think that they're going to go out there and do bad things to the ground or the water or the animals is absolutely ludicrous. But yet, the majority of people out there somehow believe they're out there destroying the world for Wisconsin. That, in turn, becomes a public opinion. That public opinion, in turn, goes to regulation. And why I focus on regulation so much is because out of the 7,500 dairies in Wisconsin, 280, get that number, 280, are regulated. That means they can be fined, they can be referred to the Department of Justice, they have to follow rules. And it's not that the rest of them can go willy-nilly and do, they're all good farmers and they all want to practice good practices, but these are the people that, for some reason, the government focuses on because they have control over it. We have cost sharing. If you don't have cost sharing, they can't regulate you. So if they can regulate you, they can show a win in a column. So the year of the water, we can get a win with those CAFOs. Well, what kind of win are we getting? Regulating 280 farms more. Is that a win? Is that helping Wisconsin? We'd like us to take a bigger approach and look at what are we doing, all of us. Let's look at a watershed. Is it just the farm in the watershed? Is it just the CAFO? And I'll give you a, a statistical example, and bear with me for just one minute here. So we have these wells that are contaminated, high nitrates. On the DNR website, you can see where the CAFOs are located, and you can see where the percentage of the wells are for higher than 10 parts per million in that county. So Kiwani County, you all heard about, because that's national, national news. They got 15 CAFOs in Kiwani County. They are at 3.3% of their wells are over the 10 parts per million. That is required. Iowa County, on the other hand, in the southwest, where we just heard about that little issue down there in the press, Iowa County has zero CAFOs. They're at 12.5%. So is it the CAFOs? Probably not. I mean, we have to be reasonable in what we look at. 280 farms in the state of Wisconsin can't pollute all the water. So it's perception. And the Discovery Farms are doing a great job of teaching people and teaching people about agriculture, all over agriculture. If you haven't been there, go there. It's great. It's in Newton, Wisconsin. But we have a perception problem, and we have to work at that. And that is driving other things to happen. Sometimes people like to shoot at a big target because it's easier to hit. Oh, well, we got a big target. We got a big uh, target. Steve? So I think, you know, again, as we're at Future Wisconsin Summit today, um, I think one of the things that all of us has to grasp is that, you know, Wisconsin, because of our agricultural base, we've got a great opportunity to be a significant part of the challenge of feeding the world. And so I think we need to, to really understand that agriculture in Wisconsin is a big player and, and has a big and bright opportunity to, to help feed the world. And so what I would ask is that as, 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 as a factory, we've taken a lean journey. And one of the things we found with our lean journey is, is we do a lot of gamba walks. And so gamba means that going to the actual place, seeing the actual facts, uh, being, being with where the, where the issue is at. And so I would ask us as, as businesses and as governments and as education, let's go do gamba walks together. Let's go to the actual place and let's, go to, let's see the actual facts. Let's, let's see what's going on. Let's come to a common understanding because if we have a common understanding, then we can understand actually what the problem is. And then we can put our collective energies together on how to best solve that problem so that we can take advantage of the opportunity that we have with our agriculture industry here in Wisconsin. Great. Well, thank you again to each one of you. This has been very, a, a very good discussion, very educational. Um, everybody, please join me in giving a round of applause for our panelists.